So, may I now invite our fourth speaker for today. She is the founder of Narejo Human Resource and author of 10-year running column and now book of Workplace Sanity. She has been working with Fortune 500 company with the background of psychology and neuroscience, stirred with 18 plus years of hands-on HR consulting. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Ms. Rahila Narejo. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much uh, to Learning Minds and to Sahil for including me in this amazing event. And I think I wanted to give them a big round of applause. So will you join me? Yeah? <laughs> what a great opportunity for us to interact and actually learn from this interaction. And today I hope to add to the learning that you're having since this morning with my own little perspective, which is coming from the background of psychology and neuroscience. So let's get our slides up. I'm not sure if we're gonna have it on both or on one side. So in your manuals or your workbooks, you should have a handout for this session. And it's basically a one-page handout, right? And you have some space there to take notes, and believe me, you will want to take some notes because we are going to be talking about one of the most interesting things that you have in your possession. And that is your, any guesses? It's your brain, yes. So open up your workbooks and let's turn to that page. And I am going to, do I just uh, click here? Do I just use this? Yes? Oh, I think I have to get off stage again. <laughs> Kamran Saab, it's your turn. All right, well, so we're here to learn about something really important. And believe it or not, you're not the only one who has a brain. Guess who else has a brain? The person sitting right next to you. The people that you manage in your organizations. Even your boss has a brain. Your team members have a brain. Your customers, they have brains. And this was hard for me to digest, even your spouse. Yes, they too have a brain. <laughs> I know. It was, it's hard to believe it, but they do. And your understanding of what makes the brain work, what makes it uh, react to stimuli, what motivates it, right? what engages it, and your understanding of that makes a significant impact on your effectiveness as not only a leader in your organization, but also as a parent. Also as if you're in marketing or sales, as a salesperson. Also as an entrepreneur, if you are selling a product or a service to human beings, then you need to understand this thing right up here, which is your brain. So that's what we're gonna be looking at. And today we're gonna be talking about the neuroscience of leadership. And why do you need to understand the brain? Because this is the one and only driver of all our behavior. And if we don't understand what is driving our behavior, then we are putting ourselves at a significant disadvantage. So when we talk about the brain, a very famous person said an interesting thing. It's no longer about head counts, like if I were to count the heads in this room, I think we have about 300 people here. Today, what's inside the head counts. And what's inside that head of yours? It's the brain, hopefully. <laughs> so leadership and people in leadership roles need to understand what goes on under the hood. And in fact, this is where we see the world heading towards. Leadership as we know it today. Just this morning, I looked on Amazon and I went to the book section and I typed in leadership into the search bar and I got 80,000 results. 
So we have a lot of information out there. Leadership is the most talked about topic. Look at today. All we're talking about is leadership. It is the most written about topic. And organizations every year spend billions of dollars training their leaders, right? But yet, we see statements like this. We see people say that they trust a stranger more than their boss. How many of your team members would say that about you? And we hear people say that they would rather have a better boss than a pay raise. So obviously what we're seeing, something is not working. We need to change our approach. We need to change our methodology because what we're doing right now is not working. So where do we turn to? When we look at historically the timeline of leadership and the way we manage our human resources, anyone in HR here? Can I see HR? Good, okay, HR, you gotta pay attention to this. The way we manage our human resources in the beginning, turn of the century, what did we experience? 1900s, kya hua tha? Industrial revolution. We needed people to man our factories. But what was our perception of people? Like how did we regard them as? We looked at them as just another purza within that equipment, that factory machinery. We went on and we started to enter an age where we wanted to tweak our processes. TQM was born, total quality management. We wanted efficiency. We wanted optimum performance and productivity. What was our perception of people then? Again, let's turn them into well-oiled machines. Let's monitor how many widgets they produce per second. And if someone is not producing the required amount, not good. Then we went on in time and we found technology being introduced. And then we paused for a moment and we were shocked. We were like, oh my God, does that mean we don't need human beings anymore? No. In fact, we re realized we need human beings to manage those equipments, those technologies, those programs to push the buttons at the right time. So people were still there, but they were not really what we are seeing today. And what are we seeing today? Have you heard of knowledge workers? How many of you are knowledge workers? Meaning that you don't have to go to work, you don't have to do physical labor, you are hired to think. You are hired to come up with product ideas, you're hired to come up with strategies, right? Innovation, how many of you, majority of the time, you have to do thinking work? And surprise, surprise, guess which part of your body does that work? It's not, it's not your knees, it's not your angutha. it is your brain. So what that tells us is, in this era, we are managing knowledge workers. And so these old ways of managing people, regarding people, they are out the door. They are done and over with. And we really need to wake up and begin to understand this knowledge worker and the key tool that they use, which is the brain. So if I ask you, does leadership need to change? Do we need to change our approach? Do we need to change our concepts of what it means to be a leader and to be an effective leader? Yes, definitely. And to help you on that track, I'm gonna introduce you to three very weird and surprising facts that we now know about the brain. And what are those facts? The brain is like a muscle. Rational, yeah, logical thinking, rational thinking is overrated. And social needs, human to human connection 
is primary. So maybe Maslow got the hierarchy a bit backwards. All right, and I'm going to give you a little insight behind each one of these. And at the end, I'm going to open the floor for more questions. Because once we start talking about the brain, guess what? The brain loves to learn about itself. And as you learn about, when it learns about itself, it's like a little self-actualization. It wants to learn more. Or batao, or batao mere baare mein. Or ye kya hai. So we'll open up the floor for some questions. So let's begin with the first surprise. The brain is like a muscle. So what I want you to do is while I share this surprise with you, everybody raise your left hand, okay? And keep it straight out in front of you, straight out. And do not put your hand down, don't put your arm down until I ask you to, okay? So keep it out, keep it out, good, good job. So what is this first surprise? I want you to imagine that you decide that it's about time I got physically fit and get, you know, get some muscles and, you know, become uh, more strong in my stamina. So you decide to go to the gym. And you go to the gym and you start lifting weights. Uh, 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 aapka haat niche gaya. Hello. Haat upar rakhna hai. Haat upar rakhna hai. Upar rakhe. Don't put your hand down. So you go to the gym and you start lifting weights. And you begin with your left arm. And you go one, two, three, four. You lift weights and you do a lot of repetitions. And karte karte aap thak jate. So you get okay, aaj bhot ho gaya, let me come back tomorrow. You come back the next day and you begin again with your left arm. You go one, two, three, four. And again, you poop out and then you say, okay, kal dekhte hai. And you repeat this pattern over and over again. And pretty soon you see that your left arm has become quite muscular and shapely and strong. And your right arm is the same old wimpy, flabby right, thing that it was when you started. And even you have noticed that when you need to now lift something or, or, or pick something up, automatically your left arm reaches out. How's your arm doing? How's it doing? Is it getting tired? Yes? Well, guess what? This is why I'm telling you your brain and muscles have a lot in common. If you want, you can put it down right now. <laughs> okay? If, if it feels tired, this is telling you something very interesting about your brain. Your brain has neurons. And these neurons, the way they work is very similar to your muscle tissue. The more you use a muscle, what happens to it? The stronger it becomes, the easier it becomes to use your left arm because you have worked it out. The less you use it, the weaker it becomes. The smaller, the, it shrivels up. So similarly, your brain has neurons. The circuitries, the neuron circuitries that you use more of become stronger and stronger. And those are what we call your habits. The things that you do automatically. You don't have to make much effort, right, to do those things. But the circuitries that you don't use, they also shrink. They shrivel up. They don't disappear, but they become smaller and weaker. And this phenomenon, what neuroscientists call, is neuroplasticity. And the amazing thing about neuroplasticity is that you can actually think and build certain circuitries and weaken other circuitries. And this is called self-directed neuroplasticity. Now, what does that mean for you? This brings you to brain rule number one. Neurons that fire together, so those that are activated, that are used, wire together. Right? They become stronger and stronger. And this is called Hebb's Law. Right? It's a law. We know this for sure now. But what does that mean for you as a leader? So what? Okay, my brain, I can strengthen some connections. I can weaken some connections. Well, this has significant impact for you as a leader. Because if you're using your brain, and by using, I mean not just doing what you normally do, your habits, 
your habitual responses, normally you, what you say and what you do. But by learning new behaviors, by practicing new habits, new actions, by experiencing new and novel situations, you develop neural circuitry that resembles something close to the Amazon rainforest. You have very thick and dense neural connections. And this is not only validating the saying that we all know that learning is from the, learning is from the cradle to the grave. In fact, neuroscience has validated the saying as not just a good practice, but it is now a medical prescription. If you want to save your brain from degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, then being here today is a good start because you're utilizing your circuitry. You're activating new thoughts. You're looking at new concepts. And just this action of learning builds new connections. And so when Alzheimer's will affect you. In fact, what the research shows is we will all get Alzheimer's. But some people in their lifetime, they exhibit the symptoms of Alzheimer's, like forgetfulness, memory loss. But other people, although they have Alzheimer's on autopsy, we see 80% of autopsies of natural deaths show onset of Alzheimer's. But those 80% never showed the symptoms in their lives. The difference that they found in an extensive research is the difference between those two types of people who actually show symptoms of Alzheimer's and those who don't is one difference. Can you guess what that one difference is? It's lifelong learning. Learning should not stop once you finish your bachelor's and I'm done, I'm over with. Or you retire, oh, I had enough, now I'm just going to relax. No, your learning needs to continue. New experiences, reading, exploring, challenging yourself to learn new skills all the way to your last breath. Learning is definitely now from the cradle to the grave if you want a healthy, long mental life. Now that's for you. What does this mean, neuroplasticity? for the people you lead. So if you're not learning, right, so, and your brain is not making new connections, hopefully you're, none of you fall in this category, your brain is essentially going to look like a desert island with just a couple of trees sticking out. Very easy for Alzheimer's to manifest on this island. Now when we talk about neuroplasticity, there's a a psychological phenomenon called the Pygmalion effect. Has anyone heard of that, Pygmalion effect? And essentially what that means is you get what you expect. How many of you in your team, you have someone that you can say, Are, ye to mera chita hai. that's someone who you can count on. Who can you rely on? You can hand over work to with full confidence that this person will take care of it and they'll do a good job of it. How many of you have such a person on your team? Can you raise your left arm, left hand? Hi, 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 yes. Now keep it up, keep it up. What I want you to do is turn your palm to the back of the wall, back wall, and bend your arm at your elbow very carefully and give yourself a pat on the back. Because that cheetah is a cheetah because of you, Shabash. Good job. Your expectations have molded that person to live up to their optimum potential and to become that cheetah that you rely on so much. Now, how many of you have a team member that I like to call the, okay. you don't have to say the name, okay, but I know the picture has come in your mind. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. So if you have a, a papita on your team, I want you to raise your right hand. 
Maybe you have more than one, okay? Right? Right? Yeah, we got a couple of those, yep. Now raise it high. It's okay. There's a lot of papitas. If we, there were no papitas, we would all be on the moon right now, okay? It's those papitas that keep us on the ground, <laughs> that keep us grounded. Keep it high. And I want you to turn your hand into a fist. And on the count of three, I will swiftly, I want you to swing and give yourselves a good right hook. Because that papita is a papita because of you. This is essentially the Pygmalion effect. You get what you expect. When your cheetah walks in and says, oh, can I help you out? And you're like, oh, cheetah, aage? Aha, aja, aja, hat bata. <laughs> but the same situation, if your papita walks in, sir, can I help you out? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's our expectations. And this is where we are directing the neuroplasticity in other people. Parents do this all the time. When you compare your children with other children, when you compare your eldest with your youngest, or your youngest to your eldest, get all right. Organizations and HR, I'm talking to you, do this all the time. When we begin to call some people, what do we call them? Hypos. Guess what? Turns them into a, a hypo. But then the reverse is also happening. By calling someone, uh, all of you are not hypos. Guess what you just did? You turned them further into not hypos. And so we need to rethink what we are doing in our organizations. What are we doing? We are actually causing ourselves more damage. And this is a phenomenon of neuroplasticity. Your brain is like a, a muscle. So is that surprising to you? How many of you are surprised by that? Some insight, like, wow, I didn't know that. OK, well, that's not all. If you thought that was surprising, here's a second surprise. Rational is overrated. You think you're a rational person? You think you're a logical human being, right? Well, let's see, let's find out. I'm gonna give you a little quiz. I'm gonna ask you some spelling questions. And I want you to spell specific words out, out loud. So I wanna hear everybody's voice, okay? And if I can't hear the person back there, Kamran Sahib, your son, I need to hear his voice, right? <laughs> All the way back there then you have failed. So I need to hear every single voice. I'm gonna ask you a question. So first question. When you sit and relax in a tub, it is spelled? Okay, got it? This is what we're gonna do. So again, I didn't hear everyone's voice, so let me repeat the question. When you sit and relax in a tub, it is spelled? When you hear a funny story, it is spelled? The white of an egg is spelled? The white of an egg is spelled? Ye kya ho gya? My God. <laughs> Your rational brain, my goodness, so intelligent, rational, logical. And those of you who are still lost, the white <laughs> of an egg. Tell your neighbor, please, unki confusion thora dur kar de. Is not spelled Y-O-L-K. Okay. What just happened here? 
This shows you what's going on inside your brain. You are not a rational thinker. We like to believe that we are, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're not at all. We are emotional creatures that sometimes think. Kabi kabar. Mood hota hai, to soch lete hai. But majority of the time, we don't think. And what am I talking about when I'm saying thinking? In fact, what we discover now from neuroscience is that the circuitry, the way our brain, Allah Ta'ala has put together, is that we feel, we feel emotions. We react non-rationally before we rationalize. And so what's going on in our brain? There are two parts that I want you to know as a leader, as a parent, as a teacher, as anyone who needs to influence other people and their brains, you need to know these two parts. The first part of your brain is called your limbic system. And this is the part, the blue shaded area, which is right smack in the center of your brain. And this is where that Y-O-L-K came from, right? It is the emotional center of your brain. And it's the part that does not think rationally. In fact, this is the center where you get that instinctive response. The fight, flight, or freeze reaction is coming from the limbic system. Now, in this limbic system, there's a particular structure called the amygdala. How many of you have heard that before, the amygdala? Right? If anyone is familiar with emotional intelligence, you would have come across that. Now, the amygdala has a very interesting job. It acts as your brain's security guard. What it does is your incoming information from your sensory systems, your eyes, your ears, your smell, your touch, your taste, it gets first dibs on it. It comes first to the amygdala. And the amygdala screens the incoming information looking for threat or reward. Is what I'm experiencing right now, is this a, a either a potential threat for me or is this a potential reward for me? And if it decides that it's a threat, we experience something called the amygdala hijacking. It takes over your brain and it makes you either fight or flight. It's a protective mechanism. Now the other part of your brain that you should know as a leader is called your prefrontal cortex, or PFC for short. Everybody put your hand on your forehead, right behind this forehead, okay? And Bara mathe ka matlab ye nahi hai ke bara PFC hai, okay? Okay, don't, don't get mis no, misinterpret nahi kare. Right behind your forehead is a really small region of your brain called the PFC. And I like to call this, it's called the conscious brain. Whatever you're thinking, you're listening to my voice, you're trying to make sense of what I'm saying, and you're trying to understand the concepts, this is the part of the brain that is doing that work for you right now. And I call it the hosh. What did I call the limbic system? The josh, okay? Hosh and josh. This is a part of the brain that helps you make decisions, to help you solve problems. It even helps you to remember the things you have learned. It draws it into your conscious. Yad karna. And it also helps you to learn new things. Until you don't put your PFC's attention on something new, you cannot input information into your long-term memory. And interestingly, it even inhibits your responses, like eating half a cheesecake and blowing up at that idiot who put patrol in your diesel running car. Yes, both have happened to me recently, <laughs> okay? It inhibits your emotional urges and instinctual responses. Now, this brain does not like to work, 
Now let me give you why. Why doesn't this PFC like to work? Well, because it has inherent limitations. First limitation, it has a very small capacity. It can only remember three to four things at once. And unfortunately, a lot of us, what we do, we say, yad rakho, yad rakho, yad rakho, yad rakho. And by doing that, we consume the very limited capacity that the PFC already has. And Deb, you have to actually do thinking work. Your resources are tied up. So instead of using it to remember, you should use paper and pencil to remember and keep the PFC open and free to think. The second limitation for PFC is it uses a lot of energy. This small one pound matter of your whole body, barely one pound, uses up to 25% of your daily glucose intake. 25%. Imagine if you had an appliance in your house and every month your monthly electricity bill 25% of the bill came from that one appliance, what would you do? You're a logical person, what would you do? Right, keep it off or use it very carefully? Well, that's exactly what your brain does. It does not like to use your PFC because it uses so much energy as compared to the non-conscious brain which hardly uses any energy to operate. Third limitation. Multitasking is a myth. Your PFC cannot process information in parallel. It is a serial processor. You can only do one thinking type of work at a time. So you are fooling yourself. If you think you're doing two thinking types of work, you're not multitasking. What neuroscientists call this is you are switch tasking. You are switching from one serial processing to another serial processing. You're not doing both ever at the same time. And by switch tasking, you actually decrease the speed and the quality of the work that you're doing. Okay? And fourth limitation, your PFC is very fussy. It's like a spoiled child, right? We've all had to deal with those little spoiled children, the temper tantrums. Well, your PFC is that spoiled child. It needs everything perfect. It needs the right amount of rest. Neend puri karna. It needs the right amount and balance of nutrition. And it needs the right amount of dopamine, stimulation, right? Get a little excitement in order to work optimally. And if it doesn't get this Goldilocks amount, the absolutely just right, it shuts down. It doesn't work. And the fifth limitation, it's a benefit and a limitation, is it looks for patterns. It looks for systems, consistency, patterns. And when it learns a pattern, like I put you in a pattern, soak, joke. The pattern, it looked for a pattern and it said, oh, I got the pattern. Now I'm not gonna think anymore. I'm gonna let my non-conscious brain do the thinking because I figured the pattern out. So when I asked you the third question, you were not using your PFC. Your non-conscious brain gave you the wrong answer because it was running on a pattern. So although it frees up the PFC to hardwire things to the non-conscious, it can also be very limiting and detrimental to your work and performance. So that is your limbic system, that is your PFC, and the last thing that you need to know about both of these two systems is they work like a seesaw. What does that mean? If you've ever seen a seesaw, in a playground, so when one child pushes up, the other child goes down. And when this one pushes up, this one goes down. Your two systems in the brain work in a similar manner. So when I got you all to shout out and say, spell the word, I was activating your limbic. 
I was getting you excited. I was getting you emotional. And when your limbic is turning on, guess what goes to sleep? Your PFC. Right? So that leads us to brain rule number three. When one is on, the other is off. And a brilliant example I had recently, when I got really upset and angry, something really pushed my button, my amygdala button, puri dunya andheri kali ho gayi thi. I couldn't see anything. Sivai us cheez ke, crystal clear, in my line of sight, the thing that pushed my button, my husband's face. Right? He's not that, that bad. He's a pretty good guy. Right? So when one is on, the other is off. And as a leader in the workplace, which brain do you want your people to have on? Which part of the brain you want their PFC on? So you don't want to stress them out more. Use fear tactics and threats. Because when one is on, the other is off. Neither do you want to get them too excited. Right? Get in a khushi se pagal ho ge. Vaki khushi se bhi pagal ho jate. Because whether you are angry and upset or whether you are happy and excited in both situations, guess what? Your PFC turns off. And that's why it makes really sense. Okay? Allah Ta'ala ne jo hamare systems hai, our laws and the way we manage ourselves as human beings. Have you ever noticed the process for divorce? Right? Three times spaced out. Why? Why is it three times spaced out? So that your emotions, right? At that moment when you were angry and upset at your spouse and you're like, So let your limbic calm down, let your PFC turn on, and rethink it another time. Again, rethink it. Use your PFC to make that decision. But what's surprising to me, when we get married, do you get three months to say, Kabul hai, Kabul hai, Kabul hai? No, because they want ke khushi se pa. Right? <laughs> so two surprises down. And the last surprise. Social needs are primary. And what do we mean by that? Let me tell you a story. And you'll understand what this means. I want you to imagine, after today's learning event, tomorrow, Sunday, you were relaxing and you were thinking about all the wonderful things you learned and the ideas you got from the sessions and you got a brilliant idea. You said, ah, oh, why don't we do this in our organization or why don't I try this in my team? And you're so excited, you can't wait till Monday. Monday comes because you want to find your boss and you want to share this brilliant idea because you know your boss is going to appreciate you and agree with you. That is a wonderful idea. Let's do it. And so in your excitement, Monday morning, you get ready and you rush to work and you're climbing the steps up to in your office and your ankle twists. Ah, oh. you say, aage baro. Boss ko doom na hai. Usse pehle ke wo ke meeting mein na chala jai. So you limp your way and you find your boss. And he or she is talking to one of your colleagues, your team members, who you don't really get along with. And they seem to be in a very deep conversation. They don't notice you limping your way towards them. They're having this conversation. And they hear something, they turn and they look at you. They look back at each other. They look at you. And you're limping towards them. And before you reach them, they quickly part ways and go in opposite directions. And you stop right there. 
at this moment, where is it hurting the most? In this twisted ankle? Is it hurting here? Where is it hurting? It's hurting here. That is social pain. And in fact, the research shows that the brain cannot even differentiate between physical pain and social pain because in the brain, both regions that are activated overlap. They're like the same for the brain. And that's why, just go grab some Tylenol. Why? Because painkiller acts on the same region of the brain that is for physical pain and for social pain. But there's a catch. Physical pain, yib aapka bichara ankle, teek ho jayega. Or jab bhi aap yaad karenge ke, oh my God, us din my ankle, oh, kitni takleef hui thi. Will the pain come back again? No. But whenever, jab bhi aap yaad karenge us din ke mere boss or mere colleague ne mere saath kiya kya tha. Guess what? It's going to hurt. And in fact, it's going to hurt even more, especially if it wasn't resolved. It's going to hurt more. So even now we say social pain is worse than physical pain. So what does that mean for you as a leader? How can you use this concept of social pain to make you more effective as a leader? Well, this whole concept of pain and pleasure, this is essentially the brain's basic operating system. The brain, every moment, is making a decision. In fact, five times, five decisions per second. It's making a decision whether to move towards something or to move away from something. It moves towards something it perceives as pleasurable, and it moves away from something it perceives as painful. Perceives. It doesn't even have to be real. But sochi kafi hai. Ki ye hamare liye khatra hai, ya ye hamare liye fayda hai. So this system, this binary system, is activated through physical pain and pleasure, like food, right? fornication, and drugs. Right? This is all physical. But they are also activated by social triggers. Hundreds of neuroscience studies have been put together by Dr. Rock in this framework called the SCARF model. And it summarizes the five social triggers that can take someone either away in a threat state, and in a threat state, your limbic is on. The fight, flight reaction is full sweet, right, full in speed. Or in a reward state. Now, we don't want people to be extremely in a reward state. You know why, right? Because an extreme reward, again, your PFC is off. So we want people to be slightly towards the reward state, but not all the way to the end. That's not a good state to be in. And what can we do to bring them there is follow these five triggers. You send signals. You send these five scarf signals to people around you all the time. And every single one of your brains is looking for answers to these five signals. So what are those signals? Number one, status. When you walked into this room, your brain automatically started to scan the people and started to think, oh, kya main in logo ke barabar mein hu? Kya main in logo se behtar hu? Ya kya main in logo se junior hu, niche hu? Your brain assesses. You're not consciously doing this. This is at the unconscious level. 
And if it feels that you are better or barabar, where does it go? And if it feels, oh my God, so, so many people I don't know and they look so much senior to me, older than me, oh my God, more experienced than me, guess where it goes? In the trap state. The second factor, certainty. The brain wants to know, needs information. If it doesn't have information, doesn't know what is expected of it, where am I supposed to sit, what am I supposed to do, what's the agenda, khana kab milega, it doesn't know, it, it goes into a threat state. In the workplace, when you don't give your people feedback to let them know whether they're on the right track or on the wrong track, you are putting your people in a threat state. But if it knows, if it's clear, it knows what to expect, it goes into the reward. A for autonomy. If someone, my boss, is micromanaging me, looking at every single piece of work, email I write, report I do, line I craft, guess what state I'm in? Threat state. I don't have any autonomy. My ideas are not asked. I'm told what to do. Nobody asks me what I want to do or what I think should be done. I'm in a threat state. Opposite, reward. R, relatedness. Do I feel like I belong here? Do I feel like I'm one of the group? Do I feel included? Or do I feel left out? Like I don't belong. I'm an outsider. And F for fairness. Are policies consistently applied to seniors and juniors? People doing the same job, are they given the same equitable salary? If I do more production, productivity, outcome, results, and my colleague is not doing as much, are we getting the same bonus and increment? The brain is extremely sensitive to these five triggers. So for you as a manager, as a leader, as a parent, you need to be conscious of these five triggers. And that brings us to brain rule number four. In every interaction, you want to be focusing on minimizing threat signals and maximizing reward signals. What can I do for the status, the certainty, the autonomy, the relatedness, the fairness, so that the person is in the plus side, not in the negative side? HR needs to consider these factors when they design policies and processes. What are we doing that's pushing our people into a threat state versus the reward state? And so for you, take away key points Status, make a commitment. Don't put people down. Harsh criticism, harsh words, harsh evaluation. Okay, you're putting people down. You're degrading. You're stripping them of their status. Certainty, changing the goalposts. I don't know. Right? Be very clear what you want and expect from your people, what you want and expect from your children, from your team members. Autonomy, let's stop micromanaging. Let's stop being intrusive. Let's start trusting our people, our team, our children. And relatedness, show personal interest. Ask them how they're doing, how's their family, Show interest in their own activities, their hobbies, their lives. Make them feel like part of your circle. And fairness, a big one, favoritism, inequality in all our practices need to be given a really critical look at. So that is surprise number three. So let's see how smart your brains are. Do you remember the three surprises? Number one, brain is like a muscle. Number two, rational is overrated. Number three, 
social needs are primary. They beat even physical needs. And the four brain rules, you remember those? Rule number one. Neurons that wire together, fire together. They make connections. Fire together, wire together. Two, brain rule number two. We feel before we think rationally. Three, the other is off. So you don't want to have either one of them on or off. In fact, balance. You want to keep both of them slightly alert so that you're using your whole brain and not just one part of it, right? Slightly alert. And the fourth brain rule, maximize reward. And so I hope from this session you're taking away that this is just the tip of the iceberg about the brain. There is so much that we already know, and then there is a million times more that we still don't know about the brain. But if you can take these three rules, or four rules and three surprises, back into your workplace, back into your homes, and start living by them, you will see a dramatic shift in your effectiveness as a leader in all areas of your life. But the change needs to begin with you. And so like Kamran Sab, I also have a favorite poem. And this poem I heard around the year 2002 when I was starting my business and I was in the limbic state, <laughs> hijacked and really stressed out. And I came across this poem, you guys believe the universe gives you what you need at that moment. You being here right now in this learning session is something that the universe has drawn you to. There is a purpose for you to be here today. And similarly, I got this poem at that moment in my life. And I like to share it because I got so much benefit from that poem and I wish that other pe people could get that benefit too. So would you like to hear it? Now it's not written by any famous person. In fact, this poem is taken off of a wall of a church in England. And it's engraved into the wall, into the stonework. And the title that they've given it is An Archbishop Wrote. So I'm gonna say a line and I want you to repeat the line after me, you ready? When I was young and free, I dreamt of changing the world. But alas, the world would not change. So I narrowed my sights somewhat and sought to change my country. But it too seemed immovable. In one last desperate attempt, I sought to change those closest to me, my friends and family. But they too would have none of it. And now here, I lie on my deathbed and realize perhaps for the first time, if only I had changed, then through my behavior and example, I could have changed my friends and family, and with their encouragement and support, I could have changed my country, and who knows, I could have even changed the world. Thank you very much. Oh,